getting ready to move on with our, our next panel. And we uh, once again have a have a great group. Are we ready to go? Well, let's yeah. bring up Stephen Rodriguez. Ah, well, then I guess I'm going to moderate. Yeah, that's OK. Uh, um, so, hey, Stephen, um, well, if you come on, we'll uh, we'll take care of you. I think we have you in our green room. Uh, but we're going to have a conversation now about developing the space industrial base. And we some, uh, have some uh, really wonderful speakers who are uh, panelists who are all invo involved in the investment community. I'd like to bring on Delion. I'm going to butcher your name, sir, and I apologize. Asparovov. God, that was awful. So I'm not going to get an I'm not going to get an enemy he, for he, that. He 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 was amused by it. Yeah, at least I got a laugh. That's You've got something. a great sense of humor. Yeah. I like you already, my yeah. friend. Hello, Delian. How are you doing, sir? Ah, yeah. there's uh, Stephen Rodriguez. I'm so glad you're here, sir, because I was just going to ruin all the names. Yes. <laughs> well, let me. I tell you what. Before we <laughs> we mess up any more names, let me introduce Stephen, and uh, and then Stephen, you can take it away. It's great to see you too, my friend. We were concerned you weren't there, and suddenly you popped up. So uh, the magic of uh, virtual TV here. So uh, let me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, bring us up to date uh, with uh, who we are moving on to uh, turn things over to. I'm, I'm talking about the gentleman on the bottom of your screen. His name is Stephen Rodriguez. He's the founder of One Defense, a, a technology scouting organization dedicated to identifying advanced software and hardware commercial capabilities and then accelerating their transition into the national security enterprise. He has also served as a venture partner, supporting the above market venture portfolio performance of multiple New York and Washington, D.C. venture capital firms. Mr. Rodriguez began his career at Booz Allen Hamilton shortly before 9-11. So we're going back over 20 years ago now, supporting or just just about 20 years ago, supporting their national security practice in his capacity as an expert on game theoretic applications. He supported the United States intelligence community. Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security. He serves as a board director or board advisor of seven venture backed companies, as well as four nonprofit organizations as well. And in addition, he's a senior advisor at the Atlantic Council and is the senior innovation advisor at the Naval Postgraduate School, a busy man indeed. He's a graduate of Texas A&M University here in the great state of Texas and received his master's degree from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service He's published in Foreign Policy, War on the Rocks, National Review, and Real Clear Defense. He and his family make their home in our nation's capital in Washington, D.C., and we are delighted to welcome the founder of One Defense, Stephen Rodriguez. And Stephen, I'll say, first of all, thanks for being here with us again. Delighted to see you there on screen. And thanks for putting this panel together as well today. That's uh, above and beyond. We can't thank you again for your involvement and your commitment to uh, help us as, uh, as we move forward here uh, with this program. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, I got to say, uh, uh, I do a lot of these uh, panels and summits. And uh, with that uh, golden voice of yours, I, I feel like I should hire you to introduce me <laughs> you know, pretty much everywhere I go. That was uh, fantastic. He'll actually follow you everywhere you go. And he plays walk-up walk music. Yes. Whatever, whatever works for you, Stephen. I'll <clears throat> tell you what, I, you and I have never met before. So I, I'll, I'll let you know David well. But uh, I was a television news anchor for uh, 30 plus years. So that's that's probably where the voice comes from, I guess. So so you're very kind. I thank you. And, and we thank you for being here on behalf of America's Future Series. Really, David's a longtime friend. We've been working together on this uh, this endeavor for many, many years. So he told me about you. So we're really excited to have you on board. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I think what I uh, when I talked with David, about this panel um, discussing a space industrial base, if you will, uh, months ago, uh, the, the genesis of this panel, and as part of my introduction, uh, I realized that there, <clears throat> there is a well-known and, and much discussed uh, defense industrial base uh, you know, here in the United States. Uh, Going back, you know, before World War II, of course, you know, highlighted by uh, Eisenhower's famous uh, 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 speech on the matter in the 50s. But what's interesting is the, the space industry, which you know, had its advent in the 50s as well, uh, doesn't really have a fulsome and deep industrial base. And by that, I mean a series of, uh, think of it as like a pyramid of major system integrators, uh, mid-tier suppliers, and then of course, a, a healthy and robust small business community. Uh, and the reason why that's important and, and why uh, 
the panelists uh, here all have uh, venture backed uh, uh, companies and indeed Adelian is a uh, venture capitalist himself. It, it's important because as you talk to private capital partners about supporting companies in this space, there's a real reticence to do so. And the reticence re revolves around two main factors. One is if I give them money, like if I get, Delian doesn't really have this problem, uh, but if I give a venture back company money, how long till they actually see uh, revenue from customers, right? And, and that's different than getting a small business innovative research grant, right? A grant is a grant. It's to take your product and tune it in a certain way that fits the sponsor in the case of the Air Force or NASA's needs. That's great, but that's not necessarily contract revenue in the way that you, know, you might book a slot on a you know, Falcon 9 rocket going into space to go you know, deliver your wares. So that's one big issue. And, and so they say, well, I don't know if I have enough money to essentially float the company 18, 24 months until you know, their product you know, reaches a point where it can be de deployed and commercially viable. The other major concern of course, is the lack of major commercial customers that could support a Varda or a Venus Aerospace or a uh, Atomos. Uh, and what I mean by that is in the defense industrial base, if you are a, say, a mid-tier supplier, you know, a Booz Allen, a Cubic, uh, you know, take your pick, you know, there are a number of companies above and below you that you can transact with and work with. Um, prime, sub, team with. In the space industry, that is still developing. So I think at the risk of uh, uh, sucking all the air out of the room, uh, let me start uh, by introducing uh, Delian. You already uh, um, you know, uh, teed him up. Uh, Delian has a unique <clears throat> perspective because he is uh, both a, uh, an experienced venture capitalist uh, that's the last time I'll use that word, by the way. I'll just say VC from here on out uh, at Founders Fund. And then, like myself, after a series of poor life choices, decided to start a, a company as well. And unlike me, he decides to start a company in the space manufacturing business. So um, to kick things off, uh, Delian, do you mind uh, giving a little bit more of your own background and then uh, briefly talking about you know, what led you after your time as a venture capitalist to start a company uh, in the space sector and more importantly, a company in the space mining or space manufacturing sector? Over to you. Yeah, my uh, brief professional background, I originally, I come from like a family of academics. And so I'd always wanted to do something in space. And the original path was sort of the academic version of space. You know, I went to MIT, I was going to study robotics. The idea was, you know, eventually make my way over to, you know, JPL, do some, do some deep space missions. Uh, but freshman year at MIT, I ended up sort of getting sidetracked into the world of sort of startups and entrepreneurship and maybe kind of had this aha moment where I was like, oh, this might be a better way to eventually influence space. Um, but you probably can't do a space startup quite yet when you're like, you know, 19. Um, so I ended up doing a couple of other things over my first, let's say, five years in Silicon Valley. Once I dropped out of MIT, uh, I ran an enterprise healthcare company. I was the head of growth at like an e-commerce company. Uh, but now for the past four years, I uh, have been a venture capitalist, uh, the first half at Coastal Ventures, uh, the second half at Founders Fund. Uh, you know, both firms are quite well known for their aerospace investing, even before I joined. You know, Coastal is one of the primary backers of Rocket Lab uh, and serves on the board there, Founders Fund with SpaceX. Um, and so kind of had this, you know, realization where, you know, I thought I was going to have to sort of push off getting into, you know, sort of the space industry until further in my career, you know, when I saw people in Silicon Valley doing space, it was typically ones that had had hyper successful careers like, you know, let's say Elon, Chamath, Steve Jurvetson, um, that basically had made a lot of money in what I call like normal tech and then took, you know, that capital and applied it to space. Uh, versus, you know, in 2016, I ended up leading the seed round for this company called Akash Systems. They're a Ganon Diamond uh, satellite radio company. Um, and I sort of had this like sudden light bulb moment in my head where I was like, oh, I don't have to wait until like, you know, I, you know, become a multi-billionaire or something like that to do space. In the world of venture capital today, because the barriers to entry have just lowered so much to space, launch costs being lower, there being so many more sort of, you know, companies on the market, 
you can actually now invest today with you know millions of dollars, not you know billions of dollars. And so started sort of taking space more seriously uh, rather than just as a hobby. I used to just kind of you know talk to some friends, you know follow some online communities, but I started you know going consistently to you know space conferences, symposium, small sat, um, uh, you know the DC uh, symposium. Um, and started to realize that there was a lot of opportunities. And so I kind of kept, you know, investing in a variety of different companies. Um, now I think I've invested maybe about six different sort of aerospace, you know, type companies, like Cautious and being the first, I've done a small sat repulsion company, uh, obviously Varda, which I ended up incubating, um, uh, a company that sort of does like the flex port for aerospace and defense machine shops. Um, so a lot of sort of interesting, you know, companies that have, you know, come across my way. Um, but there's this idea that was always sort of stuck in the back of my head, which had originally inspired me to get into space, which was around sort of orbital manufacturing. And, and, and the reason it had always sort of stuck in my head is when I had heard about the idea, I kind of had this like aha moment where, you know, up until now, the only way that we've sort of made money in space is by sending photons up and down, right? It's been earth observation or telecommunications, which is like an interesting first step, but it's very much like the first step of how one, you know, commercializes space. But like, obviously the next step is like, you need to start moving atoms around. Um, and that orbital manufacturing had a lot of capabilities that were proven out on the ISS over the past you know, two decades. We've known that there are materials that have a lot of value from being produced in microgravity, but nobody had seemed to really tackle that sort of you know, commercially or at scale. And so sort of had this aha moment where I was like, hmm, let me go out and like analyze the market. I went and met with a lot of the companies that were sort of working on this. And I was like, okay, these are mostly like, you know, kind of as Steven said, sort of NASA and SBIR like research organizations. They don't have sort of clear near-term commercial viability. And these teams aren't even really interested in it. Like there are for sure companies that take SBIRs and use that to then, you know, get to something near-term commercially viable, but none of these were interested in it. And so um, I'm in a somewhat unique position at Founders Fund where we actually regularly do incubations. Uh, you know, most of you might be familiar with Anderil, uh, which was incubated at Founders Fund about three years ago. I started decided to take a relatively you know, similar structure of you know, join as the chairman of the board, similar to how Trey Stevens is chairman, and sort of put together a really great sort of founding team that had the necessary skill sets to sort of do orbital manufacturing, you know, the way that I think it should be done. And the thing in some ways that it excites me the most about the company is, you know, I, I really believe that you know, space supremacy is one of the, you know, should be and is one of the you know, top sort of national security priorities. And I don't think that the way to gate to space supremacy is purely by relying on sort of you know defense and research dollars to offset some sort of space infrastructure. The best way you know to do it is the same way that we got you know this device developed. The defense community could have never afforded to develop you know this device. It would have taken you know decades and uh, you know trillions of dollars. Versus when you you offset you know uh, individual you know customer consumer commercial dollars and use that to build up an infrastructure, um, it ends up being a much more sophisticated infrastructure. And so that by developing the infrastructure like Varda, where we develop the first products up there, start to bring them down, we can actually get to something that is 10 times, 100 times the size of the ISS without a single dollar from the defense and, uh, uh, and research community. But we're more than happy to work with the defense community because I'm sure that there are a lot of interesting applications when one has a 10x the size of the International Space Station station up there. Um, and so I think that by focusing on these sort of very near term commercially viable things in space that actually advances space far faster. So I love Elon and his talks about Mars and things like that, but I'm a very much like pragmatic near term focus. The way that we really you know, make space exciting is by focusing on this near term commercial viability. Brilliant. And I'll, I'll do my best to keep my uh, expanse references to myself. <laughs> Uh, so what's neat about our panel is it's not just that we have uh, entrepreneurs who are, uh, are leading venture-backed tech companies, but they fit in different areas of, I'm probably using this inappropriately, but the technology stack go into space. Uh, Delian is in space doing space mining and space manufacturing and a lot of capabilities, frankly, that stem from that uh, and I think will benefit us here on Earth. Uh, Vanessa Clark uh, focuses at Atomos, uh, focuses on what we call the, the space bus uh, or a space bus play, if you will. Um, and I think it's really interesting because Vanessa comes from a uh, quite a bit of a different background uh, than any, any of us have. She worked uh, at length at Lockheed Martin as well as DLR in Germany, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, so I guess a, a question I have for Vanessa, if you want to give a little bit more of your background as well as chime in on this is, you know, how did uh, your experience, you know, working at a major system integrator like Lockheed, 
help you go to market with a company like Atomos or Atomos. Sorry, I'm trying to get my inflection correctly. And and uh, what? How does that kind of inform uh, you know the the growth on the R and D side as well as your go to market strategy uh, going forward? Yeah. So thanks. Firstly, thank you for inviting me to this panel. It's uh, um, definitely been an interesting discussion so far. Um, before I directly answer your question, I'm talking a little bit about the foundation of Atomos. So I was working um, for a launch vehicle manufacturer in Europe, so Astrium, so now uh, Ariane Group. And then I was at DLR, so the German Aerospace Center that's basically a mini NASA. And I was always in advanced research and development and particularly at the agency had a bird's eye view of the launch sector. And we were asking some really fundamental questions like, is the industry and infrastructure that we have right now sufficient? And if we made changes to the launch infrastructure, what could happen to the industry? And so this is back way before SpaceX had landed the first stage of their Falcon 9 rocket. And we you know, really looked at reusability and we're like, oh, you know, this does have the potential to really reduce costs. And what happens if we reduce costs to low Earth orbit? Um, and throughout that research phase, really discovered the problem like, okay, we're getting lower launch costs to low Earth orbit, but higher orbits are still very, very inaccessible. Uh, we just heard Tori Bruno before talking about the ACES upper stage and some of the capabilities that they want that system to have. I mean, there are missions that we just simply can't do because launch vehicles and onboard propulsion systems are inadequate. And these aren't just defense missions, which is really what Tori was implying, but these are also some commercial missions. And in the future, civil space and exploration missions as well. And so it was really through my experience at agency and large industry where I saw the problem that now as a startup, we're trying to solve. So um, I've been in the US since 2015 and most of that time was at Lockheed here in Colorado. I think working at a large integrator like Lockheed can be a double edged sword. I mean, it's like any large transitioning from any large company to a startup. It has all of the drawbacks, you know, certainly your support system and the existing processes, the infrastructure, the um, your gravity of your position and the company that you represent is suddenly stripped away when you move to a startup. But being in an integrator could see the ecosystem from both sides. So could see Lockheed's supply chain, could see Lockheed's um, vendors and partners, but then we could all, I also got to work with Lockheed's customers. So I could see how everything fit together. And one thing that we've really done as a company has been to shape our go-to-market strategy to leverage partnerships. And we, in a lot of cases, it doesn't make sense for us to invest in a lot of facilities or capabilities that aren't core to our business. And so we've been able to use my experience at Lockheed to learn how larger companies do that and how to leverage that um, at a faster pace for a startup. Oh, that's great. Um, I think um, one of the things that I, I know, Vanessa, you and I have talked about before is the, <clears throat> the challenges of engaging uh, a space industrial base, if you will, in terms of helping a company like Atomos and, and others, you know, literally get the market. I mean, if there was ever a, an appropriate term for getting the market, it would be in the space industry. Um, so I, I think, uh, it, it offers a nice pivot to um, our third panelist, Sassy Duggleby, and my, uh, I have to say, my, my fellow classmate uh, at Texas A&M University. So uh, good to see that we're representing well in the SEC and as part of the uh, America's Future Series. Um, <clears throat> Sassy, you, you have a, 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 an incredible background uh, to include your time at Virgin Galactic, uh, one of these major space uh, system integrators, if you will. So... Uh, I guess what I'm curious, uh, if you can give us a little bit of your own background as an experienced entrepreneur, uh, you know, in multiple areas, not just space, as well as your time at Virgin Galactic, how has that helped you and Venus? If you, and if you could talk just briefly about what Venus's uh, superpowers are, uh, how has that helped your company uh, cross the, and this is a term I, I, think, I've, I think I've coined, so uh, much like Goldman Sachs, I, I expect full credit going into the future. Um, how has that helped you uh, cross the orbit of death, if you will? 
Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, so just to just to clarify, we were at Virgin Orbit. Um, oh, Andrew, sorry. My, Andrew, my co-founder, started at Virgin Galactic, but it was already the small sat group and spun out as as Virgin Orbit. Um, yeah, so our background is- well, The or actually, orbit of death is even more appropriate, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, so we um, we actually had a trailer manufacturing company in College Station and bootstrapped that, um, and then were able to exit that company and move to California and join the Virgin Orbit world um, and learned all about aerospace. And you know, I personally didn't have an aerospace background in, until I spent the last couple of years. Um, I have an engineering degree and MBA and have spent kind of my my career on the business side of tech companies and across the board in different tech companies. Um, and I would say aerospace is no different. Ultimately, it's still high tech. Um, but then we we left Virgin after launching the after the first demo launch to spin out Venus. Um, and ultimately, our goal is to build a space plane. Um, so we're taking some advanced um, engine technologies, um, some changes in airframes, and then also uh, using leading edge cooling. Um, to create a, a global transport tool, which will, you could take off, our goal is to, you know, take off from LAX, uh, boost up to about 130,000 feet, and then become a glider, and then you would land on the other side of the world in Japan, LA to Japan in one hour, or, you know, we're here in Houston, so Houston to London in one hour. Um, but, yeah, so that, that's what we're doing here at Venus. We just raised our seed round of funding, so, um, you know, we're, we are in the super early stages, um, but finding the correct fund funding team, finding people that are willing to go deep tech, you know, this isn't something that we're going to have on the shelf tomorrow. <laughs> you know, we're on a long journey. So trying to find patient capital um, had, was key in, in our fundraising journey. And and maybe as a quick follow-up for, for uh, Sassy and Vanessa, especially, but Delian, feel free to chime in. Um, <clears throat> it, I'm at a VC where we uh, invest primarily in, in, you know, in software, SaaS-based plays. Uh, as you have gone out to market to, to you know, seek venture capital, how have you, uh, how have you, it, I'm sure you've encountered plenty of people like me uh, who say, well, I, I mean, you know, wait, what's your, your, what's your ARR for 2021? And you're like, <laughs> you, you mean 2023 or 2024? And it's not really ARR, but I take your point. So how have you uh, helped uh, uh, VCs understand um, the play that you're in, especially those who wouldn't normally consider themselves a, a space technology investor? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, on our end, we, we joke we had to kiss a lot of frogs to find our prince, <laughs> you know, to find those people that were willing to go deep and deep tech and weren't looking for the, um, you know, the quick turnaround. Um, and so it, it was a long fundraising journey for us, um, but we found the right team that was willing to say, no, the opportunity at the end of the line, I mean, hypersonic transport is estimated to be a 300 billion per year market by, you know, 2040. And so that, you know, we, we found a group of investors that said, we're willing to put in that money now to, to get those returns, you know, not in two years, but maybe in 10 years or 20 years. Mm. Um, so, and then we've also, you know, I, I give the... The Air Force and DOD, there's a lot of grants and things out there. You know, we've, we've got an Air Force STTR and, you know, there's other opportunities out there to help buy down some of that risk. Um, and we're absolutely looking at, you know, how can we find early revenue pathways? How can we partner with different, um, different parts of the DOD to um, use some of our technologies in ways that aren't necessarily for our ultimate goal of the space plane, but um, get, us, get us there earlier. Vanessa, anything to add? Yeah, so we've um, say taken a slightly different approach where the service that we start providing, I mean, our first spacecraft goes up of August in August next year. That is immediately a product that can supply service that the Department of Defense wants. So we're really focused on fostering the Department of Defense as a service customer. So we do have R&D contracts, but they're all focused on changing our service to, set, to suit the DOD rather than you know, more of, I think Dillian also alluded to this, like the NASA um, route, which is to fund technology development. You know, we've approached the DOD and said, you can help us get this service to market faster and we can also make these small changes to suit you. So um, 
I have to say, I do not envy Sassy uh, with her long timeline and working with the DOD through um, R&D phases. We were very, we're very fortunate that we can start offering services a lot more quickly than, uh, than her company is able to. And, and we're looking at opportunities to get to earlier revenue. You know, there, there's some there's some pieces of technology that, that we think that we we're talking with the DoD that are interested in. That's not ultimately the space plane, that'll, but it'll help us. You know, that's our long term goal. Um, but there's some ways we can spin out um, earlier things. Yeah, I'd say in relation to your you know initial framing of the question, which was you know how do you sort of find the investors um, that you know understand this stuff? You know, I'd say. There's a actually relatively broad set now of investors that will sort of do series B and C and beyond in space companies, um, especially because at that point, typically, yeah, you're starting to sort of see those initial revenues flowing. People have seen sort of material exits, right, you know, through, you know, companies like SpaceX, um, you know, Planet Labs, Skybox, et cetera. Um, but I'd say the area where it still feels like it's like by far the most narrow is actually like the Series A. Like at the seed, it feels like there's actually a decent number of sort of space angels, exit entrepreneurs, et cetera, that will fund. At the BC and beyond, you have these like later stage funds that are comfortable. But at the A, you're still taking on like a lot of technical risk where you're putting actually a decent amount of capital to work. And it's amazing to me that there's effectively really only like six, maybe seven like venture firms. Like yeah. you're not going to get individuals to sort of do an A. It's too large of a tech. You need an institution. Um, and the only ones that really do that are, you know, two of the firms I worked at, Founders Fund, Coastal Ventures. And then beyond that, it's effectively, you know, Bessemer, Lux, you know, DCVC, Steve's new firm, you know, uh, um, Future Ventures. Those are basically the Series A targets. I mean, there's maybe like, you know, a handful of others, but much more rarely and infrequently are they doing sort of aerospace Series A's, whereas those six firms are really the only ones that do it on a regular basis. And at each of this, at those firms, it's not like the whole partnerships. It's typically like one partner, maybe one junior person in addition to that. And so it's amazing to me that like, yeah, if you look at, you know, the, the total Silicon Valley ecosystem, there's maybe 12, 13 people that you can go to that will actually take a board seat of an aerospace company at the Series A. Uh, so it's still an extremely small ecosystem. So this is a good uh, pivot, um, Deli, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to keep talking, um, especially especially if your cat keeps making that cameos. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the uh, this is a space that's very very sexy. I think space has always captured people's imagination and in, in pop culture. Uh, you know, you know, yesterday you and I were talking about Dan Suarez is, of course, eponymous novel, uh, Delta V. Um, and what's interesting is um, if you, you know, the first chapter, they talk, you know, you think it, it's, you know, I don't read a lot of, I should read more fiction, but uh, the first chapter uh, immediately goes, you know, from a, um, a an anecdote to basically macroeconomic theory in space and why we need to go to space from an economic argument. And I, I thought that was fascinating. So <clears throat> in an attempt to kind of blend the cool factor with reality, right? We all have to, we're all trying to, you know, uh, you know drive uh, value early on to capture, you know, shares of the market. Um, you know, what are some challenges that people who are interested in space technology, whether on the investing side that you, you have experience in, or from a national security perspective, uh, what do they generally miss or just simply don't understand when they talk to you and say, oh, Delian, love what you're doing, love to be a part of it. You know, what, what are things that people just don't seem to understand about the space that I think you and I'm sure Vanessa and Sassy could chime in as well? Yeah, I think there's like this sort of, in some ways, because it's so capital intensive and, you know, sometimes difficult to operate in, you kind of have to like balance yourself on a little bit of like a knife's edge. There's a lot of companies that fall on one side that I describe them as sort of maybe too unambitious and they end up looking just more like sort of small defense contractors, maybe developing one very particular like undifferentiated component or maybe more like services revenues. They look more like a consulting organization than they really do an actual sort of, you know, product driven company that has an accumulating advantage over time. Um, and I think part of that is it can be difficult to actually fund a sort of quote unquote, like real space company. Um, you know, you know, it can only, you know, if you're, if you're trying to bootstrap something, a lot of times it can be very tempting to take this sort of, you know, consulting based approach, but I think it's like really hard to transition from that into sort of like quote unquote, like real space company. So there's a whole subset of those that I call them as like the less ambitious, but you know, only because it's so difficult to be sort of ambitious. Then there's others that basically fall on the other side of the knife's edge, which is just like, I call them like the sci-fi companies. Like, I can't tell you how many times over the past like five years, I've had people come and pitch me space hotels. It's just like, 
Okay, so that's interesting. I like look forward to when those are viable, but there's like so many things that need to happen before like space hotels happen, including, you know, Varda is one of those, right? It's like you need to have space. Space factories are definitely coming before space hotels, right? There's much more of a commercial incentive to like develop autonomous, unmanned space factories. They're much cheaper, they're much easier, and there's a lot more value in them versus like a space hotel is like incredibly expensive. And like the value of, you know, of a day or two in space is like high, but not as high as some of like the products that we're able to develop as an example. Uh, and so there's a lot of these companies that I just described as like pure sci-fi, where just like the time frames that they're thinking about are just so far out and they have no clear just like stepping stone, you know, plan that gets there. And I don't love the plans where like, you know, sometimes some people present me like, oh, we'll do this business first and then we'll do this other business and then we'll eventually get to space hotels. And I'm like, just do your first business, like pitch me on that. These like multi-step approach. It's like hard enough to build one startup, let alone like build three in a row that like somehow perfectly like sequence together. Um, and so the, the area where you want it to be is right on that knife's edge where it's like, it's near term enough that like you have like, you know, real revenues and real services that you can like bring to market today, but it's got like a differentiated enough piece of technology or is ambitious enough that like basically if it works, it's particularly exciting, right? So it's not just like a, hey, we're a satellite integrator. And if it works well, then you're one of another hundred satellite integrators or something like that. Um, but it's something that, you know, like uh, Tomos, where it's like you, you have a differentiated piece of technology. Nobody else is really trying to develop this service. If you develop this service, you're able to get this like accumulating advantage after your demonstration mission that like allows you to then go out and raise more money and get more customers on board and serve more people. And that's actually like a true sort of like, you know, product driven, you know, type company. And I think there's it's difficult to sort of like, you know, balance that knife's edge to find something like ambitious enough that it has some sort of accumulating advantage when it works, but not so ambitious that it's out in, you know, you know, sci-fi land and there's not a clear like, here's a sort of step-by-step, -step, you know, capital plan that takes you from where you are today and relies on ideally, you know, some amount of, you know, defense dollars and, you know, venture capital dollars and, you know, commercial dollars in tandem to eventually sort of develop your, you know, product and service. And so that's a lot of the deficiencies I find. So I'd say, you know, 95% of the time, companies that I meet with basically fall in one of those two camps. It's very rare that you meet somebody um, sort of balancing that nice edge. Uh, Deli and I should get you to pitch a Tomos for us. Um, so coming back to like some of the issues that we had raising capital is that, you know, Deli mentioned there's only a few small groups who invest, you know, post seed who really know what they're doing. We've found that there's a lot of capital going into space companies, but it's all going into the same type of company. I mean, there are now, tens, maybe even a hundred uh, venture backed launch vehicle companies. And the differentiation between these companies is kind of limited. And I can see why investors are pouring money into them because I mean, it's sexy. It has kind of the flywheel effect that Delian was talking about. It does promise to be scalable, but there are so many other opportunities that aren't as mainstream in investing yet. And I guess a lot of the investors that we've encountered are really waiting for someone to signal that this is a good opportunity. I mean, they'll look at, oh, you know, uh, Rocket Lab's been very successful. Oh, they have great investors. This is a good segment to invest in. But other companies, I guess, like mine and Sassy's, it's, there isn't that reputation that this is a really good, interesting segment for venture capital yet. So, uh Vanessa, to, uh, to keep picking on you, um, when we talk about larger uh, integration partners such as SpaceX, you mentioned Rocket Lab, of course, ELA as well, um, you know, what can they be doing to uh, support emerging venture back uh, uh, space tech plays, uh, so, uh, you, know, you know, frankly, such as uh, Atomos and, and Venus as well? Like, because you know, it follows that, you know, and I've, I've talked with like the Seraphim Capital guys in, in London. And the challenge is, is, you know, whether you're a, a $50 million fund like our, our fund two is or a billion dollar fund, no amount of money can kind of, you know, one VC cannot keep an entire company afloat, especially in space tech for long. So there's a theory out there. Uh, I've talked with, you know, Ethan Petransky at Venrock about this, that, well, maybe not, you can exercise non-dilutive funding um, to help, you know, bridge that, that tech gap to the, where they can go to market. But of course, usually, you know, non-dilutive funding also, uh, I think you can get, uh, you can get further with that if you have a, a major integration partner. Uh, that can, you know, potentially become a, concern, a commercial customer themselves. So um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, anything you agree with or disagree? Or what should we do? Yes, I have a couple of ideas around this. Um, first, 
you know, my experience is really with Lockheed and they are very active with their venture arm, but they really only invest in companies that business units are interested in. And then they'll really support those companies. I mean, we saw yesterday or the day before that Lockheed announced that they're buying 58 launches from ABL, which is a small launch company that Lockheed Martin Ventures invested in. So Lockheed is really great at that, but they need to have, um, but they typically do the corporate investment first before they support the startup. Now, taking on corporate dollars is a, um, again, potentially a double-edged sword. Um, Lockheed typically has been pretty good in terms of just wanting to, not really caring about ownership and just caring about um, supporting companies that are interesting for them. So the corporate venture arms, if they do it right, they can be really, really powerful. The other thing that large integrators can do is um, really twofold. So one is we're actually working with a larger company right now for our first mission. There are some things that weren't strategic for us to own, but still needed to be developed and flown. And so we actually um, worked with this partner and had a great deal where they're like, hey, we understand that you're a, you're a small company um, that's currently mostly just um, funded by private investors. We can actually defer some of the payments until after you're more successful. So having not a big cash outlay to work with this partner has been really phenomenal. And you know, um, I, it, it was really kind of a surprise arrangement that I think has been working really well. Um, ultimately, it's hopefully going to help that company as well be a sustained partner for us with more revenue for them. But you know, they took a bet on us, not quite the same as an investor, but as a partner. The other thing that larger companies can do is really try to match up their supply chain and their supply chain risk and innovation with specific programs. So we see, particularly the DOD, is changing how they want to operate in space. They're having proliferated constellations, so smaller, cheaper satellites, but just more of them to have the same mission assurance. The companies who are still supplying those satellites, in some cases, are large integrators but they have their traditional supply chain. So um, for programs like that, where the mission assurance and reliability of the systems is a little bit looser, I think the large integrators should look more to the innovative companies who maybe don't have as much flight heritage or maybe don't have the big reputations um, that they're used to. So I think that um, you know, it's still a slow shift um, to get these large primes like Lockheed to kind of align their supply chain to the program needs, but I, hopefully it's happening. The only comment I would add there is even as we partner, you know, as we look, you know, Venus is still early. We raised our seed round in June. And so we're three months into really building the company. Um, but as we look to partner with, you know, primes or DOD, like I, I would say our biggest concern is making sure we keep our, um, our IP, like that we get to hold it internally. And so finding people that are willing, you know, we have some world changing technology, but we want to make sure it's ours, but we'll, let's let's find the right partners that can, can ensure that the, you know, the IP stays with us. Um, so navigating that world has been, you know, we're just beginning to enter that world, but as, as a young startup, that that's one of our primary concerns. Yeah, my answer to this question is probably the best way to continue to develop this ecosystem is just, you know, more exits. Uh, you know, I think, you know, I had a friend at another venture capital firm back in 2017 that used to, you know, constantly quip on the fact that, you know, back then the only real financial exit that space investors have ever had was Skybox selling to Google, you know, back in 2008. Um, you know, and obviously that has changed a lot, uh, you know, over the past four years between, you know, SpaceX having a lot more liquidity, uh, several of these companies spacking. And so, um, you know, I think that's one of the, you know, in some ways the best ways to sort of, you know, create a deeper, you know, capital ecosystem is, you know, as investors start to see that there's real returns, more investors start to come in, uh, makes it easier for founders to raise, makes it so that there's more companies and just continues to spin that flywheel. No, that's great. And and I, I want to uh, TF Sassy, but before I do, uh, let me remind the audience to add their questions in the uh, Q&A function down at the bottom of the screen. If you, uh, it should pop up over on the right hand side and you can punch your questions in there and we'll, we'll answer them in turn. Uh, Sassy, you brought up a great point about um, IP ownership, which is a uh, contentious issue with um, 
the government and the, the private sector that tries to engage with them. Coincidentally, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, by accident, uh, got into the OTA market uh, six or seven years ago and uh, saw a lot of things that you know, to do right and a lot of things that were done wrong in the, in the industry as a process. And one of the interesting things was one of the uh, OTAs actually originated in the 50s when we, when we realized that we had a, uh, a gap between us and the Russians, uh, with the Russians, and we had our Sputnik, uh, Sputnik moment, and a big issue um, with government funding flowing into uh, Xerox Park uh, and other uh, defense, World War II era defense contractors in uh, what's now called Silicon Valley was uh, speed to market and IP ownership rights. Sound familiar? So uh, NASA created this thing called OT, other transaction authorities. And what's interesting is to, these days, OTAs have been bastardized as a, hey, you can get on contract quickly with the US government, which you can. The main role of OTAs though was it offers very favorable legal terms for in favor of the, the private sector entity uh, when negotiating with the US government. Um, so would love, uh, <clears throat> would love your thoughts on what else the U.S. government should be considering or doing uh, to support this, whether from, a, you know, and obviously DOD and NASA being the primary uh, touch points for the space industry. Uh, one final point before you chime in, um, interesting pop culture uh, reference. Um, I believe it was in Wired magazine, but if you Google it, I think it was a fantastic article about Silicon Valley called The Valley of the, of the uh, the heart's delight, and basically Silicon Valley was an agrarian plain where they had mainly art, artichokes. Actually, uh, I mean, who doesn't like artichokes? Uh, <clears throat> but and it talks about how this agrarian plain, over the course of just a few decades, um, transitioned into you know what it is today. So really cool uh, reference, and obviously Xerox and uh, OTAs, you know, bear a small share of that uh, credit. So over to you, Sassy. You know, I would say uh, I got sidetracked on artichokes, <laughs> so trying to come back to the conversation. Um, so I, a couple of points. I, I know like fast, fast ability to get money in. You know, we as a startup, I can I can say one example. We applied to the NSF seed fund in August. We still haven't heard anything. Well, you know, eight months, nine months in the term in the life of a startup is an eternity, and so. Um, I would say as a governor or government organizations, and that doesn't necessarily apply to the DOD because I know AFWorks has been really working on improving the speed at which they can put out contracts. Um, that's one of the keys is just speed. As a startup, we are working so fast and moving so fast. I mean, we, you know, if I showed you what we did three months ago, it's drastically different than what we're doing today. And even our strategy is changing that quickly as we learn more and get more absorbed into the industry and, you know, talk to different players. Um, so to me, speed is probably the number one thing. And then number two is just making sure that, you know, we're, th that we can protect our patents. So if the OTAs are a great example of that, um, you know, finding ways to, to do that, whether, whether we're working with a prime or we're working with the DOD or we're working with DARPA, you, you name whoever we're working with that making sure that, um, you know, we don't have a team of, of incre incredible lawyers on our back right now. We're, we're a small, nimble group. And so we want to make sure it's also not overly expensive to work with an organization. You know, we we have a great law team, but our counsel, but by the time we get them involved and then it just, we churn and churn, it, it gets, um, it gets cumbersome. Um, so, so recognizing that, you know, let us grow, let us move fast, you know, give us the tools to fly and then hopefully we can bring something to the, to the system. I don't know if Vanessa or Delian have thoughts on that too. No, I agree with everything that you said. I um, also have to commend you for being so cognizant of all of the pitfalls so early. Like we definitely, as a company, um, you know, got advice at the last minute, um, but it's, yeah, I, could, I agree with everything you said. <laughs> yeah, I've been so far, I haven't, you know, encountered this issue too much, but I think partially it's because yeah, maybe, uh, you know, some of my companies haven't done these sort of larger, you know, partnerships where these types of discussions have come up yet, but um, it's interesting to, you know, hear about it from the other panelists. 
Well, on a related topic, um, and Vanessa, you have some experience. Uh, you, you and I have a, a shared uh, uh, a geographic experience having lived and worked in Germany. Um, what are your thoughts? So just to briefly set the scene, um, <clears throat> issues around CFIUS, right, or, or foreign investment in U.S. companies, but also, frankly, foreign customers in U.S. companies uh, um, have, have really come to the forefront in the last five years or so. Um, so the challenge as an entrepreneur, of course, is, you know, you never want to artificially rule out a potential customer segment, you know, such as our, our European allies. And, and there are a number of major uh, European uh, corporates who, who uh, are outstanding in space. So have you encountered this issue at all? Um, and, and that issue being the uh, engagement with foreign customers and, and how have you uh, sought to navigate that while obviously trying to get as many customers as possible to uh, satisfy persnickety VCs like Delian and myself? So um, we're really fortunate in that, um, so one of our advisors who's actually going to be joining us is VP of engineering, has a background in ITAR, EAR compliance, as well as in program management and aerospace. So she's um, essentially allowed us to determine what we can present to foreign nationals. And for us, you know, we can talk to foreign nationals about the service that we're offering, um, but we can't talk to them about like, here's like under the hood and how it works. And so one of the challenges is um, convincing them that, you know, this is a reliable, low risk thing to do. I mean, the first step in working with a customer is rendezvousing with their satellite in space and capturing it in a secure way. And so the mechanisms as to how that works, we can't talk about, or we can just talk about the outcomes. And so we've found that our first customers are probably going to be US-based just because we can be a little more open kimono with them. Um, and one of the biggest issues for us has been avoiding foreign ownership. Um, you know, we'll be talking to, um, so we do have one foreign investor right now who's an angel investor who kind of have to um, firewall from any technical information. Um, but you know, we just raised around right now and we had to be very cautious with some of the meetings that we had because we would be suddenly be in a partner meeting and you would realize that every partner is a foreign national and potentially from a country that um, is not a US ally. And um, we were reading some studies actually this week where 16% of deals have foreign nationals from um, controlled countries in them. And so there's a lot of venture dollars coming from these countries and a lot of interest from non-US allies to get into these types of deep tech deals just so they can see kind of what's going on in the US. And so we've really had to be conscientious about what capital we receive as a company so that we are completely CFIUS compliant. Yeah, I can, I can echo that. And it's actually a challenge on our part because we do want to make sure we comply and um, have, you know, with CFIUS and knowing, you know, it, it might look like that's one thing we were warned by someone not too long ago. It's like, it might look like an American fund with American stuff, but mm. you know, what's really coming in from the back end and, and how do we as startups navigate that? I don't, and I'll be throwing this out there. Is there a source out there we can, where we can go and find like, yes, these are vetted US based investors and they're clear. Um, you know, that would be extremely helpful for us as we fundraise. Um, and as you know, we, as, as we move down into the next rounds, because um, we want to do it right. And, and you know, it's a, you, you never know who you're really talking to. And it's a bit of a moving target. Uh, so official DOD policy for the audience is uh, characterized or summed up as protect and promote. So basically the, <clears throat> the, um, the saying goes, we need to you know, figure out what technologies we need to be protecting and what technologies we need to be promoting. So this is all balled up in a broader uh, uh, the, uh, and a separate discussion around trusted capital. And I think I led a discussion on this at a uh, America's Future Series event in the fall. And the big challenge here is get ready for it. We don't really know what we need to be protecting 
and what we need to be promoting. So to Sassy's point, you're not wrong. Uh, if you engage with US government, it's a bit of a moving target. And so that that's a challenge because of course, the one thing you can't abide by is folks wasting your time, right? Waiting nine months to hear back on a relatively straightforward response. Uh, the other thing you can't abide by is having someone move the goalposts on you and say, oh, well, you know, you, you were okay. We thought it was okay six months ago, but now it's not okay. Well, are you gonna, are you gonna provide some support to me? Nope. Yeah. So that's, that's, this is a challenge that I think um, the Biden administration can uh, double down on. And frankly, the good work that uh, the Trump administration put in place around CFIUS, uh, you know, through uh, White House Office of uh, on, uh, Science and Techno Technology, uh, as well as uh, the U.S. Trade Representative. That's just a separate discussion. Um, one final, uh, actually, let me say the final kind of wrap up uh, question I have for you guys, and, and let's jump to some of the uh, <clears throat> let's jump to some of the discussion points here. So um, let's see. So we've talked a little bit about this, but um, if if anyone didn't have uh, did you know felt like they they had an, something to add, feel free to. Um, Sebastian Asparella says. Uh, can you share your experiences when it comes to partnerships? What is the thought process to identify when, and this is actually good, when to partner and how to approach the partnership process? So, you know, you know, if anyone feel free to take a whack at that. I think it's particularly critical, especially in like later stage, you know, financing rounds for these types of deep tech companies where, you know, revenue can sometimes be really far out. If you can sort of get, you know, sort of commitments from sort of large, you know, uh, counterparties or partners uh, that are willing to say, when you actually bring the service to market, we are willing to pay this much. We believe this company is going to be able to bring it in like a year and a half or two years. That's what those sort of Series B, Series C investors and beyond underwrite to. Typically, these growth investors aren't trying to dive deep into the technology. They're having some like modicum of the understanding, uh, understanding of the technical risk, but they're really relying on these like large commercial partners. And so, you know, sort of the example, you know, most recently that, you know, Vanessa referenced earlier uh, is Lockheed with, uh, you know, ABL space systems, where sort of that, you know, partnership and relationship that they have with Lockheed has come with a lot of pros for them in terms of their ability to, you know, fundraise from sort of late stage, you know, growth, uh, growth investors that wouldn't have been possible. And so it's definitely something that we think about a lot at BARTA is, um, you know, yes, we want to be a startup and we want to be nimble and we want to be quick moving, but like in order to, you know, provide true sort of market validation for the products that we're bringing to market, we're much better off if we have sort of multiple large counterparties that are willing to say, when this product is brought to market, we are willing to pay X, Y, Z dollars. We believe that this like fits within our business model. Here's how much revenue we can do because as growth investors aren't going to like call another startup and be convinced that they'll be able to actually provide you revenue. They need to see a large counterparty where they can trust like, okay, when, you know, Varda brings the product to market, Lockheed's going to still be around to actually you know, pay for those revenues. And so um, I think, I think they can be incredibly important, uh, but at the same time, obviously do come with some trade-offs around that, you know, IP speed, et cetera. And so it's definitely a delicate balance to hold. Yeah. So when we assess if we're going to partner or not. I mean, there are really two key ways that we've been partnering. One is really for technology and development. So when we're developing something, we typically always do a make by trade. And part of that is how strategic is this IP and the competency um, for us owning this? So for example, our first mission, like there um, are aspects of the system that we really um, don't care about. I mean, they enable the mission, but they're not strategic. These are things like, um, spacecraft avionics, a spacecraft um, thermal management system. Whereas there are big chunks of the system where we really need to master them. So for us, it's all the rendezvous system, the capture system, docking system, refueling system, and the onward propulsion system. But like really everything else, it could be commercial off the shelf if it's available. The other area where we partner is really with sales and go to market. So we're starting by partnering with launch brokers you know, they're trying to sell slots and launch vehicles and our service can really accentuate um, what they can offer their customers. We're partnering with launch vehicles, then we're partnering with satellite insurance providers. And then lastly, uh, in a couple of years, one thing that we're gearing up is to partner with satellite bus manufacturers. So even though um, our service is compatible with most satellites, satellites can be optimized uh, to be used with us. So essentially we leave out the big expensive onboard propulsion system and just leave a small propulsion system for collision avoidance and station keeping, which means that 
we have to change how we're designing and making satellites, which means we have to partner with the folks who are making those satellites. And so, you know, that's a very easy strategic decision for us to make because we're also not giving away IP, um, but we also provide value to those satellite operators and vice versa. Great. Uh, another great question from Victor Fishman uh, uh, is around workforce or talent. You might call it talent acquisition and talent management. Um, uh, is he, as he says, uh, um, is it difficult to find startup appropriate employees uh, who share the vision technical or who understand and, and share the vision as well as the technical and growth challenges uh, with your particular companies? What, what's been your individual experience? Yeah, so for us, um, we've definitely been able to bring in great people because of the vision of the company and also because we can offer like complete ownership. So something that's a little bit different to larger companies is like uh, early days of SpaceX and probably the same as um, Sassy's company and Delian's company. Like you bring someone in and you're, and you're like, we don't care how you do it, you can get it done. Just get this thing done, accomplish this for us. And so they can have total ownership in that little domain, which is something that's rare in larger aerospace companies. And so kind of the blend of you know ownership and feeling the impact that you're having combined with the vision has definitely allowed us to bring in some great people. Delian, Sassy, I know both Delian, I know you guys are rapidly scaling after you raised a you know, raised from founders and Lux. And, and by the way, I'm channeling my, my inner Bilal Zaberi with uh, representing Duncan. <laughs> what, what, what's been your experience? Yeah, I mean, I think we've had a, you know, let's say, you know, relatively, you know, unique path. We, you know, ended up raising $14.5 million over the course of like the first, you know, sort of three months of the company. And so uh, because that have been able to both, you know, scale up and attract, you know, sort of a level of talent um, that, you know, was not what I was expecting, let's say, even, you know, four months ago before we were starting the fundraise process. Um, you know, in particular, our you know, CEO at Varda Space Industries, Will Brewy, uh, he was the lead hardware engineer on the you know, Crew Dragon at SpaceX. But not only that, was head of mission control for eight of the cargo ISS missions. Uh, and, and I believe it was SCS 7 when the Falcon 9 actually blew up mid flight. Uh, made a couple of sort of in the moment decisions that were critical to allowing the dragon to send down some flight data that allowed them to identify the root cause mm. uh, of the explosion. And so because of his experience at SpaceX, both with building the vehicle, flying the vehicle, making some really tough in the moment decisions um, that you know ended up being sort of critical to the company, he had a really strong cadre amongst the sort of SpaceX community. And so uh, it's been incredible to see him sort of, he's a relentless recruiter and is more than happy to, you know, pull out people left and right from SpaceX. And so I think we're up to maybe 17 engineers, you know, full time. Um, I'd say about two thirds of that, you know, sort of were ex SpaceXers and, you know, on average had a tenure there of like eight plus years and we're, you know, REs or even currently sort of skip levels, you know, to Elon. And so uh, it's been really, really great to see sort of his ability to, you know, recruit, you know, some top tier talent. Um, but I think that, yeah, the combination of, you know, idea, team, you know, sort of cap table, uh, you know, and fundraising amount, uh, you know, has made this process uh, definitely, you know, easier uh, than expected in some ways. Brilliant. Um, yeah, and the channel, your, uh, your, your boss, uh, Peter Thiel, and, you know, or channeling zero to one, I think he says the, the most important, you know, factor is uh, the people and the mission. Um, and, you know, not the foosball table or the, I mean, breakfast tacos might be a, uh, a hard out, but I'll, I'll keep my opinions to myself. Um, final question as we wrap up, um, we have a lot of people on the call who, and actually this is a nice segue to the next uh, uh, discussion. I, I can see uh, Ken Mullis on, on the line as well. And I, I think it'll be great to talk about different types of capital to help uh, the industry get to market. Um, for, we have a lot of entrepreneurs on the line as well. What's the one piece of advice you would give to those either considering starting a company or, uh, you know, currently, you know, trying to go to market, you know, uh, within the space and in industrial base? Uh, so we'll we'll go Dell and Vanessa and Sassy to close out. Yeah, I think my biggest piece of advice, um, which I think you know, I tried to you know follow myself, is just get to know the actual commercial space industry. I think a lot of people sort of you know come up with their you know ideas for an aerospace company from like yeah reading a sci-fi book or you know just following some online community. But it turns out like 
the ecosystem is actually quite small. And in order to understand sort of where the gaps are in the market, you need to go out and like actually understand the market. It doesn't take, you know, this isn't like software startups where you'd have to spend, you know, a decade to get to know, you know, everybody that works in software. Like you can do this over the course of, you know, two, three, you know, four years to really deeply understand, okay, here are the capabilities of what everybody's bringing to market today. Here's the timelines on that, the amount of capital that they've raised. Okay, here's like, you know, the gap that I identified, the partners that I can work with, the people that are excited about this, the team that I can put together. Um, I think if more people sort of spent time you know, both with the actual sort of venture-backed founders of companies, the actual venture capitalists, including, you know, I saw that Jeff Cruz on the line, like people like him, like myself, um, you know, really getting to know sort of uh, the people that are building these companies and the people that are funding these companies, I can, I think makes it a sort of much higher likelihood of success uh, before, you know, sort of deciding to go out on your own. Great. Vanessa? Yeah, so I really agree with what Delian said. So one thing that we've also done is, um, bring in senior people for business development and sales. Like in a lot of cases, we couldn't get in the door as a small startup to do the sales and business development that we wanted to. So now we have a fantastic um, senior business development leader who was a VP at a large aerospace company who has worked with all the folks we need to sell to for 30 or 40 years. Like, um, you know, one like that really changed our business. Like that was a big inflection point when we brought him on over a year ago now. Like um, it's really good coming in with some naivety because you're going to try things that no one else has tried before. Um, in some cases, maybe for good reasons, but coming without baggage is good. But then you also need to realize where your weaknesses are and bring in someone who can bring some credibility. And I mean, I think both Sassy and Delian have done this with the teams that they've built. But for us, you know, we started with a small scrappy team. Uh, a lot of our folks were from smaller companies, but we realized that to get in the door, we needed someone who had a bigger name and a history with the folks we're selling to. I, I would echo what Vanessa said. I mean, we already were looking at advisors to help us get into positions that we're not familiar with. Um, I would encourage entrepreneurs. I mean, I've never had more fun in my life. You know, it, it is crazy every day I wake up and think, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're really doing this. Um, and so, you know, I would tell entrepreneurs it's way harder than I thought. It's way more exciting than I thought. Um, but there are great people out there. There's, there's great opportunities out there. And, um, yeah, it's 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 been a fascinating journey already, and we're only, you know, we're not even a year into it. So that's awesome. Well, I uh, um, I ran a venture backed AI company about a decade ago, and I realized uh, uh, that I was not cut out to be a, a space tech entrepreneur when I was watching the Expanse. And I, I slacked one of my colleagues and says, "I don't understand. Why are the ships traveling in the direction of their engine?" And he goes, "Well, you have to decelerate in space." And I was like. Uh, yes, that's. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to go back to my day job. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for uh, participating, uh, Delhi. And I know it's uh, you had to crawl out of bed uh, on the West Coast, so thanks for thanks for the effort. Um, I uh, uh, really appreciate uh, the support and sponsorship from uh, David and his team. So, with that, I'll turn it over to you guys for the next session. Thank you. Stephen, thank you so much for leading this. Uh, thanks also, Dadalian, for allowing me to butcher his name and be so uh, good natured <laughs> about it and for getting up in the morning. I think if I was, it was that early for me and somebody butchered my name that way, I might not be as gracious. So I want to thank him for that. And, uh, and uh, I guess that uh, gets to the point that what your, your group was making there. One of the major points you make was, is really about people. And I guess there's one thing that we share in common, the, the VC world that you guys work, uh, live in. You know, you're betting on the jockey, not the, not the horse, right? And uh, our business is the same way. If it wasn't for great, smart people like you, we wouldn't have a show. So anyway, we appreciate your being the, 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 um, the stars of this and yeah. sharing your insights. So we yeah. want to thank you. And thank you in particular for putting the, the group this together that you brought together. Truly, uh, you know how to get great people uh, together to work on something. So uh, I, I learned everything I needed to know from Jimbo at Texas A&M, David. Yeah, well said. Well, said. <laughs> well I'm going to thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Scott, who will introduce our next uh, uh, panelist.